everyone. My name is Guy Wallace. I've been an ISD -er since 1979, so this is my 40th year in the biz. And I've been a consultant, an ISD consultant, a performance based ISD consultant for 37 years. Today we're going to focus on lesson mapping and the analysis data used in that. First, a few slides for an advanced organizer. Today we're going to talk about performance data and the enabling knowledge and skills data. And then we're going to talk about the lesson map. We'll come back to both of these in a few minutes. This all happens within my performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven training and development methodologies, the PAC processes. The PAC processes include five ISD methodology sets. On the right hand side there you can see there's curriculum architecture design, then modular curriculum development, which is the ADDI level of my methodology set, IAD, Instructional Activity Development, for when you need to build something other than courses, nowadays referred to as resources, performance support, job aids, those kinds of things. These three levels of design are fed by the packed analysis processes and the data from those. This is all supported then with the PAC project planning and management tools and techniques five methodology sets of the PAC processes. Today we're going to focus on the PAC analysis data that feeds MCD, Modular Curriculum Development. Curriculum Architecture Design produces performance-based training and development paths, nowadays known as learning paths, but I've been doing these since 1982 and I refer to them as training and development paths. There's also a training and development planning guide for the individual to personalize the performance-based training path they should be taking that matches their job and accounts for their incoming knowledge and skills from prior education and experience. MCD produces performance-based modular training and development events. And IAD Instructional Activity Development produces performance-based training and development content and performance support. This is all covered in my book, Lean ISD, that I began in 1983 but didn't publish until 1999. The cover was designed by the late Gary A. Rumler, who didn't like the cover that I had in the original version of the book that I had given to him to review. In 2002, this book received an ISPI award for instructional communication. A little background on the lesson map. I created the template known as the lesson map back in 1990 on a project with Illinois Bell. It was to be used to capture and then report back the data that would be generated via a facilitated group process similar to what I've been using in the curriculum architecture and design efforts going back to 1982. I use teams of master performers and other subject matter experts and supervisors and sometimes novice performers to generate analysis data quickly and then to facilitate the design efforts using that analysis data. So my intent was to create a format that I could use at the front of the room on a flip chart easel and facilitate the design team through the process of sorting through and organizing the analysis data. I first published about this lesson map back in 1993 in my company's fall newsletter. The original format for what's now known as the lesson map was originally this. The three columns in the center portion, the body of this lesson specification sheet, as it was called originally, included lecture, demonstration, and exercise. I changed it after this first project because that was not robust to other delivery methods 
Beyond Instructor-Led Training, ILT. The lesson map evolved to look like this, where the body includes three columns, one for information, next demonstration, and lastly application or application exercises. Again, we're going to look at how performance data and enabling knowledge and skill data feed the lesson map. I capture analysis data in a form called the performance model chart. It identifies for each area of performance, which we'll get to in a minute, the key outputs and their measures, and the associated key tasks. And we define and clarify the roles and responsibilities of all the players in the performance sandbox. Then the right hand covers typical performance gaps, their probable causes, and distinguishes those causes between deficiencies of the environment, deficiencies of knowledge and skill, or deficiencies of individual attributes and values. The enabling knowledge and skills data then is captured on knowledge and skill matrices, where for each knowledge and skill category, we generate a list of the knowledge and skill items within that category and link it back to performance and then generate additional data about each knowledge and skill item, such as would we select for this knowledge and skill or might it be something that we would have to train for? How critical, high, medium, or low, is this to the ability to perform at a level of mastery? How difficult is this to learn, high, medium, or low? How volatile is the content, high, medium, or low? And if we were to have training on this, again, if, what depth would it go to? Would it simply go to creating an awareness level, or a deeper knowledge level, or to a skill level? Back to the analysis data of performance, the performance can be chunked into what I call areas of performance. Now this is also known as major duties, key responsibility areas, even Tom Gilbert's accomplishments. But each of those carried a nuanced meaning for many people, and so I avoided that by just calling it areas of performance my version of chunking the performance for further analysis purposes. Then we produce a performance model chart for each one of those areas of performance. Again, the performance model charts capture the outputs and tasks of ideal performance and then the gaps and causes of the real performance. Back to knowledge and skills. The categories for knowledge and skills include company policies and procedures, laws, regulation, codes, agreements, and contracts, industry standards, internal and external organizations and resources, marketplace knowledge, product and service knowledge, process knowledge, record reports, documents, and forms, materials and supplies, tools, equipment, machinery, computer systems, software, and hardware, personal and interpersonal skills, management and supervisory skills, business knowledge and skills, professional and technical knowledge and skills, and functional specific knowledge and skills. I use these 17 categories to systematically elicit the knowledge and skills required to perform. The knowledge and skill matrices then capture the knowledge and skills as they are systematically derived from the performance model data. These two go hand in hand. The performance model data and the knowledge and skill data are then used to systematically assess existing content, existing training and development for reuse purposes, reuse either as is or after modification. The intent is to salvage the shareholders' prior investments in training and development and to avoid reinventing the wheels. This is then captured on an existing training and development assessment form documented for the purposes of use in the design phase that follows the analysis phase. Once we go to the design phase, the design data is captured and reported back in an event map of lessons where we have simply taken all of the analysis data and sorted it and organized it into this event map. An event map of lessons is similar to the map of the United States of America with a map of the states just as a state map is generally a map of the counties. 
At the lesson level is our lesson map, our focus for this presentation. This is a lesson map of instructional activities. There are three types of instructional activities, information, demonstration, and application. And for each instructional activity, we include a specification. So there are three levels of design data in the MCD process, event maps of lessons, lesson maps of instructional activities, and the instructional activity specification, which contains the sequence of activities and content flow, estimated lengths. It identifies the key subject matter experts, resources that might be used in the development, but generally this provides the marching orders or instructions to the developers in terms of what they are to create. So we're now going to look at the use of performance analysis data, knowledge and skill analysis data, plus the existing training and development assessment data in their use in constructing a lesson map of instructional activities. Let's focus on the performance analysis data first. The performance model charts that identify the outputs and their key measures, the key tasks, the roles and responsibilities, the typical performance gaps, and the probable gap causes help us identify what the lesson objectives are. And there may be a terminal objective and an enabling objective. I use lesson objectives to clarify the performance objectives back on the job, as well as the enabling knowledge and skill objectives within the training effort. I then go to the bottom of the applications column next to begin to discuss what would the application exercise look and feel like. We want it to be as authentic as possible, so maybe it would include doing real work or real work from last week or last month that somebody's already completed, but we will use that real work as the fodder for the application exercise. Or maybe it'll be some other type of simulation or case study. It could be a awareness level quiz. It could be a knowledge level test, but I prefer performance applying in an authentic manner what was learned as the final application exercise. I begin in the bottom right-hand corner of the column in order to discuss the possible need for additional exercises. We might need an exercise that starts off rather easy-peasy and then move into a more difficult exercise, which I might label darn difficult, before we conclude with the ultimate application exercise that could be from Hades, hellacious, as bad as it gets out there in the real world. And in that manner, we might take a learner and build their confidence with something that's relatively easy, move into something that's more difficult, and then give them the ultimate test. We can then move into discussing whether or not it would be beneficial to the learner to see a demonstration of that applications exercise. If we're going to ask the learner to participate in an authentic performance application, then let's demonstrate that for them. When I facilitate groups of master performers and other subject matter experts in this, they know whether or not a demonstration would be helpful or not. Just because you can do a demonstration does not mean that you should do a demonstration. After that, we discuss the knowledge and skills analysis data to see how that feeds the lesson map. The knowledge and skill matrices provide us with the data that we need. It links back to the area of performance and we can tie that to a particular lesson map. When we sort the enabling knowledge and skill data into the lesson map, in my example here, we could have identified that there are policies and procedures that need to be accounted for, processes and SOPs perhaps, tools and interpersonal skills. And then the job is to sequence those into the right order from a logic standpoint, with the intention being that this is how we would present it to the learner. We would give them the first piece of information at either an awareness or knowledge level, the second piece, the third piece, the fourth piece, show them a demonstration of how all that fits together 
in terms of the authentic performance that's required back on the job. And then we would begin the series of application exercises, easy peasy, darn difficult, and from Hades. Thirdly, we're gonna look at the existing training and development assessment data for reuse potential. And we might determine that we have content that's identified in our existing training and development assessment forms that feeds some of the information requirements. My intent with the two stars here is to indicate that that's fully covered. We should be able to lift and place content from a previous training and development set of content and put that right here where we need it in this new design. And we may have content elsewhere that is partially what we needed, but not fully what we needed for a demonstration and an application. But that's the intent, is to salvage the existing content investments by the shareholders and reuse them either as is or after modification. Those are the three types of analysis data that we use to complete a lesson map of instructional activities. We're shifting gears here to how I might use the lesson map in my first meeting discussing a client's request for training and development. Now I've done this several times throughout my career where after an initial discussion about what the client wanted, I would jump to their whiteboard or flip chart easel and draw out the lesson map and begin to ask them some questions about what are the learning objectives. Generally clients want to start with what people gotta know. And so I honor that and I we discuss what people got to know. What are the learning objectives? And then when it's appropriate, I shift to, well, what are the post-learning performance objectives? What do they got to do back on the job? So we can discuss both what people got to know as well as what they got to know in order to be able to do. That allows us to complete the lesson objectives. Now, when I'm first meeting with a client, I just rough that out. We don't tweak the words, we don't polish the words, we just capture the essence of what they're saying. This in a manner allows me to do active listening, quite actively in front of their very eyes and write down what they told me. And now they know that I've heard them. But it allows me to ask some clarifying questions and hear them some more and write it down in front of their very eyes. So the next thing I do, just as we discussed a little bit earlier, is that I start at the bottom right and I, I talk about what are the application exercise or exercises for practice with feedback to really build skills and confidence to ensure transfer back to the job. Of course they're interested in transfer back to the job, but they may not know how to think about that, so I've got to facilitate their thinking process about how do we get this back to the job? What's the authentic application? And we will discuss what do we really need in terms of practice exercises? Should we have something that's rather easy peasy and then moving to something that's more darn difficult and then go to something that's quite hellacious from Hades? And either yes or no are the answers to those questions. Do we need more than one exercise and what's the nature of them? Maybe it's less of moving from one that's a set that's easy to more difficult to hellacious than it is to say there's three basic types of application exercises and we need to work on type A, which might be easy or difficult or something, and then move to type B, which could be of similar difficulty, and type C, which could be of similar difficulty, or it's a mix. But this allows us to have that conversation during the request meeting. Then we discuss whether or not it would be helpful for the learner to see the expected performance prior to asking them to do it in these application exercises. Again, yes or no is the appropriate answer and the client will give you what they think is the right answer. Yes, it would be helpful for somebody to see it before we ask them to do it or not. And maybe not because of the prior education and experience, the incoming knowledge and skills of the learners to this situation. We then shift into what information is needed to be presented prior to these demonstration and application exercises. And that allows us to do the similar thing in the previous demonstration. And if you know your knowledge and skill categories, you can systematically ask, are there policies and procedures? Are there laws and regulations? Are there industry standards, et cetera, et cetera, and tease that out of the client. Now, my experience is this is where the client's knowledge is exhausted 
and yet they may know that there's things that they don't know that will be required. This allows me to shift the entire conversation into, so how are we going to conduct the analysis? My favorite approach is to use a facilitated group process of your master performers, other subject matter experts as necessary, perhaps supervisors, and perhaps even novice performers to give us that I've just been there, I know what's needed, kind of an input to the design efforts. So we have those discussions in the first client meeting, and it either leads to going and conducting more formal analysis, or perhaps the client got lucky that day and they know all the inputs that are required and we can actually frame the design here. And now we're not talking about going and doing additional analysis and design, but more moving more quickly into development of this content. This is tricky. They may think they know it all, but don't. And this is the risk that you might have to take. But if part of your process is to actually develop the content per the design and then go to pilot test to test out, is this actually authentic? And if we have a pilot test with master performers who can tell us whether or not we got it correct, is it accurate? Is it complete? Is it appropriate to make sure that we've got the right content? We can then have half the pilot session participants be target audience members so we can actually measure whether or not this creates learning of knowledge and skills that would transfer back to the job. Of course, before I let the client go in this first meeting, I have a kicker question. What content already exists, which we can identify for them and flag that and discuss that and capture where will we go get it prior to development? And then what barriers exist to the desired transfer back to the job? Will Guy, the learner, go back to the job and have the supervisor say, hey Guy, I don't know what you're doing. Why don't you do it the way I learned it, the way I've been managing this previously? In other words, do we need something for the managers and supervisors back out there in the real world so that they don't become the inhibitor to the transfer? All right, I've shifted the slide here and you may not have noticed, but up in the top right, it says you can also facilitate a team combination analysis and design team meeting using the same set of questions in the same format. We can talk about the learning objectives with a team. We can talk about the post-learning performance objectives, just so we're totally clear on the means and the ends before we start talking about application exercises, demonstrations, and information, what content currently exists, and then what about those barriers? What's tricky for most people when I get them to this point is what information needs to be presented prior to the demonstrations and application exercises. I know, I have learned, I've been burned, that if I don't control this and do this systematically, people will rattle off a list of things a list of topics that need to be covered, and then they'll get tired and they'll say, that's it, that's all of them. So my question is, well, what have we covered thus far that could guide us in deriving these and be more assured of our accuracy and completeness and appropriateness of the list of information? If you haven't guessed it, it's those knowledge and skill categories and I, again, use those to systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills based on my understanding of performance. I can do that in a separate analysis effort, and I can use that when I'm trying to do analysis and design in a combined fashion using the lesson map as my focus. An exercise that I would suggest for you now or later is to take a look at your own past job experiences. I suggest to people when I first train them on this that they take a kid job, some job that they had in high school or college, and apply this to something that they know. So they interview themselves answering these questions and populating the lesson map of instructional activities plus objectives in order to get comfortable and familiar with the process and the format. Then I would ask them to move to their prior experiences in designing training. Apply this to past projects and go through the motions, if you will, of asking what are the learning objectives, what are the post-learning performance objectives, what are the application exercises that would be appropriate, 
Do I need a demonstration before all of those? Yes or no. What information generated by the systematic review of the knowledge and skill categories and complete the form. Once you've done this on some of your past experiences, try this on jobs where you don't know the content. Ask your spouse or significant other or friends or neighbors about their jobs and try to create lesson maps for them that would fit their performance context. Again, start with the lesson objectives, discuss the application exercises using the concept of easy peasy, darn difficult, or from Hades, or use other language appropriate to you, discuss whether a demonstration is needed or not, and systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills for the information column. Always begin with the end in mind and then immediately focus on transfer. Worry about transfer. This is covered in my book, Lean ISD, which is available as a free PDF, as well as as a Kindle or a paperback. Besides that Lean ISD book, I have my six pack of books that address my pack processes for training and development. Be aware that PACT is a subset of EPI. PACT, my ISD methodology set, is a subset of my Enterprise Process Performance Improvement set. It's covered by the sixth book in that six pack. This is all about performance competence, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. It's not about learning, it's about performance. It may include addressing the performance requirements via instruction, standalone job aids, job aids built into training, or it may require training for memorization purposes and skills development. Be careful what you're doing, but in any event, focus on the terminal performance competence requirements back out on the job. Get authentic. Get real. Again. These are my pack process methodologies, tools, and techniques. Thank you for your time today. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions, comments, or concerns. Here's my email address.